Good to see everyone back this evening. Glad that you've chosen to be here with us again as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. Thankful for your attendance. It's encouraging to sing these songs and praise together and to worship the God of heaven. We're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews this, uh, this evening. We're going to be in chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. And before we get into that, we'll go through our normal review as we always do. And then we will get into the text itself. So if you will, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Follow along with me. Check the things that I say and make sure that these things are so. And again, if you have any comments or questions, as usual, please feel free. And make sure that you check me on everything to make sure that what I'm telling you is what the Bible teaches. Of course, this epistle is written to Christians in the New Testament uh, age in the late to mid to late 60s AD. Before the destruction of Jerusalem, it concerns some things concerning Judaism. It concerns uh, 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 writing to New Testament Christians whose background was of a Jewish nature who would know these things, and they were in danger of going back into the old, inferior ways of Judaism. And this is a, an epistle that is uh, emphatically a declaration of the superiority of everything new, the superiority of Christ, the superiority of His church, the superiority of this covenant, this law. Everything is emphasized as being superior uh, and is contrasted to the old. So in chapter 1, we have uh, this epistle begins by a declaration of the superiority of Jesus Christ, and he is compared in this chapter, as we all know, to three specific things in general. You have uh, three specific things. You have uh, point number one, verses one and two, the prophets of old. Jesus is superior to them. Yes, God spoke in various times through uh, various prophets in the times of old, but he has spoken through his son in this New Testament age. Now, that doesn't mean that the inspired apostles weren't also doing the will of God. They were. They were given by the directive, uh, the personal ambassadorship of Jesus Christ. And so they were speaking by his authority. Verses 3 through 9 and 13 and 14, we have the angelic beings. Now, these are going to be the same angelic beings that we'll see in chapter 2. Uh, uh, verses 14 through 17, these are angels. And these, uh, this is a reference to, of course, the heavenly beings that are greater than us. And Christ is actually superior than they are. And of course, verses 10 through 12. Whether you want to understand verses 10 through 12 as a creation itself or as a metaphor for Old Testament Israel, I don't really guess it matters. Uh, but I don't see anything in the text that would demand that this is a, a figurative use of heavens and the earth. Even though it can be used in specific texts, it is not in this text, I don't believe. Uh, but of course, the, the point is the same. Jesus is eternal. Jesus remains while the heavens and the earth Pass away. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Because Jesus Christ is superior, we must listen to him. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, or 1 through 4, we have that Jesus, uh, those who hear this message from Christ, uh, we ought to give a more earnest heed to those things. It was the things that they heard, and the things that they heard were spoken by the Lord, and were confirmed unto those who would follow by God proving the authenticity of the message by the diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. And those, of course, were in accordance to his own will. It's important that we understand that, that these, uh, these miraculous things were actually demonstrations of God's approval of both the messenger and the message itself. And that is how we understand that miraculous gifts were used to confirm the word in the first century. And, that, and that's exactly what you have in Acts chapter 2, where Peter, by inspiration, tells them that Jesus was a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. Uh, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So that's the exact same declaration. They understood what that meant, and it behooves us to study enough that we understand that as well. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, 1 through 5, uh, we must listen to Jesus or else. And the reason why we must listen to Jesus or else is, verses 6 through the end of the chapter, because Jesus uh, is superior because of his role as Redeemer. Now, we're going to even see tonight in the text, and, and, and maybe it's actually tomorrow when I was doing some of the notes today for um, tomorrow, for next week, excuse me. I was doing some of the notes for next week. Uh, we're going to come back, and, and there's the, everything, there's such continuity in this book, you've got to go over various things multiple times because he goes back and he shows you over and over uh, just emphatically some of the same information. We're going to see that concept also. The book of Hebrews emphasizes Jesus' superiority because of his role as man, as redeemer, not necessarily because of his exalted uh, nature as divinity. It has everything to do with his role as redeemer, which he did as a man. And I think that's something that, that a lot of folks miss. They don't understand that about this book, but that's exactly what you have. Go back to chapter 1, verse 4. Speaking of him by an inheritance, obtaining a more excellent name. Now, in what way possibly could Jesus have obtained something? 
If, if he's deity, of course we understand that that's just by his very nature. But it says he obtained it. How did he obtain it? By his perfect life and his death, his sacrificial death for us. That's how he obtained it. Even in the context of chapter 1, you can see there when he speaks uh, the rhetorical questions. And he says, for to which of the angels saith he at any time, thou art my son, sit thou on my right. When did he say that to an angel? He didn't. But when did he say it to Christ? When Christ died, he was resurrected and he ascended to the Father. Acts 13, 33 speaks of his resurrection. That's when angels and principalities were made subject to him. Not in the manger, necessarily, but he was exalted. He was given this authority after he lived and after he died. And when he was risen again. And it's, it, it, may be a, uh, uh, it may be semantics and it may be a fine line. But it's, it's exactly what it teaches. And it behooves us to know exactly what these things teach. Rather than being very ambiguous and vague about things. So, chapter 2, we have a good understanding of that. Chapter 3. We have a very good understanding of this because this is one of the clearest chapters uh, that we've studied so far. Broken down very easily into two parts. Verses 1 through 6, Jesus is contrasted with Moses. And Jesus is superior to Moses. And then verses 7 to the end of the chapter, you've got the consequence of disobeying Moses. And what was that consequence? Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. They departed from the living God, didn't they? They departed. They were told what they were to do in order to gain the land of Canaan. And they rebelled against this. They did not trust God. They trusted their own eyes. They trusted uh, the, the size of the folks in the land that they were to try to conquer. And they didn't feel like they could do it. Even though God said so. The consequence was they didn't set foot in the promised land. And of course, the reason why that is so important for us is we understand that the first part of that chapter says that Jesus is superior to Moses. And those who disobeyed Moses weren't allowed to enter the promised land. How much more so for those who disobeyed Jesus? Remember, Hebrews 5 verse 9 says, He's the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey Him. The implication, of course, is those who do not obey, He is not the author of eternal salvation to them. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a, is a fairly difficult chapter, uh, especially when you're trying to do memory work in it. I was talking to Eddie today. Chapter 4 and verse 6 still gives me fit every time I go through it every week. When I go through these memory verses, it's a tough verse. Uh, there's a lot of interesting language, but the, the meaning of the chapter is easy enough. Chapter 4 deals specifically with the rest. The rest that was not realized under the law of Moses. Now, was there a rest commanded under the law? Oh yeah, there was. The Sabbath was commanded. Not only the Sabbath day, a weekly Sabbath, but there was, there was more to it, wasn't there? There were yearly Sabbaths. Uh, there was a jubilee every 49 years. There was to be a, a, a Sabbath as well. And now these Sabbaths, if you'll look and if you'll study on some of these, uh, like we did the lesson, we really uh, uh, brought out some of these things not too long ago, that in these Sabbath days, uh, there was a lot of symbolism. On these Sabbaths, they were to release uh, those in captivity, weren't they? They were to, uh, on these yearly Sabbaths, they were to let their servants have the option of, of what? Being set free from what? Bondage. And why did God give the Sabbath? He gave it because he wanted them to remember their release from what? Bondage. In Exodus chapter 12, reference Deuteronomy 5. So the Sabbath is extremely meaningful, wasn't it, to Old Testament Israel. And it's a tremendous study for us today, even though it's not applicable to us today. But it's a, it's a very intense and it's a very uh, a rewarding study if we'll put a little time and effort into it. But chapter 4 deals with rest. Rest wasn't actually realized, even though it was commanded under that law. Do you think that there was any a Jew that had ever walked the earth that didn't understand what the Sabbath day was, what they were supposed to do anyway? I, don't, I think a lot of them missed the deeper meaning, didn't they? Sure they did, because they rejected Jesus and, and the liberty found in Christ. And they're, they're released from the bondage of the law of Moses and from sin. But they knew what was expected of them on that day, at least to some degree. I'm not supposed to work. Rest. Rest was commanded, but rest wasn't realized under that law. It was foreshadowed something greater. And of course, uh, Hebrews 4, the entirety of that first part of the chapter is summed up in Jesus' words in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus gives rest, not the law. Remember Acts 13, 38 and 39, that the gospel of Jesus will justify them from all things which the law of Moses could not. And that is basically the summation of chapter 4. Chapter 4, the latter half, the last three verses, he speaks of Christ as being our high priest as being our high priest, and he connects it with a certain event, passed into the heavens. Now, we have said that. Reference Zechariah 6, 
uh, verses 12 and 13, that Jesus would be a priest while he is king. And you can't separate those two. Now, when did he become priest? The same time he was given a kingdom. Remember Daniel 7, 13? He was given a kingdom when, when he passed and he went to the Ancient of Days. And that's when he was resurrected. And that's recorded for us in Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. When he ascended up into the Father. And that's when he was given dominion and kingdom and glory. And that's when he became priest on his throne, Zechariah 6, 13. Chapter 5 deals specifically with priest, doesn't it? It deals with the priesthood of men under the Levitical system. It says that men were only made priests by divine decree. And likewise, Christ was made high priest by divine decree. Christ didn't glorify himself to be made priest, but he that saith unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And see, this is what I try to emphasize, and I know that we emphasized it when we were learning it, when we went over that specific text. Please pay attention to his role as high priest to those words. When did he say it? Did he say that, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, when he was in the manger? Uh-uh. He said that when he burst his son to the bonds of death. His resurrection is specifically, see folks, his resurrection is tied directly to his priesthood because it was after his resurrection that he ascended to the Father and he was given this kingdom and this dominion and he began to reign as king and priest. So all those things are connected and it's, it's of tremendous importance for us to put all this together and to understand it. That way we have a good working timeline of these events in our minds and we're able to, to bring them out to people reasonably and rationally. All right, chapter 6. Leaving the principles. Leaving the principles is something that we all have to do, don't we? Uh, I got good advice today, and I'm going to start working on a lesson regarding what is a Christian's responsibility. What's our responsibility as it pertains to uh, uh, learning and studying for ourselves? For instance, can you just rely on me every week to bring a lesson full of Scripture, and, and I can do the studying for everybody? No. Uh, you've got that obligation, too. What about children? Is it the church's responsibility to teach the children? Oh, you know what? I'll just bring them to Bible study, and I bet that's why everybody likes these big, liberal, huge churches who, who have youth ministers, and they babysit the kids all the time. I'll just take the kids and dump them off there. That's your job, parents. You know, that, that's our job. That's the parents' job to teach it. Now, sure, certainly we can help, and we can have specialized classes to, to help this, and, and they can learn a lot in the assemblies. But it's your job to teach your kids. Is that a Christian responsibility to teach your children? Oh, is it? Is it a Christian's responsibility to learn and grow? Isn't it? 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is it optional? It's not optional if you don't want to suffer the, the consequences of verse 17. Fall from your own steadfastness. We can fall if we're not growing, folks. And it's everybody's responsibility. And that's exactly what Paul began to talk about at the end of chapter 5. And that's what he's talking about in chapter 6. We have to grow to such a degree as we're able to reasonably present the truth to others. How many folks in here, and again, this is rhetorical, don't answer, but how many folks in here could explain in detail and give scriptural references for the entire plan of salvation to a stranger? It's something that we all should be able to do, shouldn't we? Is there really any excuse for not being able to do it? Can we explain to them why, uh, from scripture, we don't have musical history? Can we explain to them why from Scripture that there's only one church and there's only one gospel? If not, why not? You know, there are folks that have been members of the church for years and years and years and years and they really couldn't tell you where anything is in Scripture. And I'm not saying that to insult. Please don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that don't you think that, that if you've been in the, the, the church for that long, you should have a tremendous wealth of knowledge? You know, some folks will get mad at me and they're saying... Boy, I've been preaching longer than you've been alive, and they're teaching false doctrine. I'm like, man, that's a shame. You've been teaching all this long, you've been wrong this whole time. I mean, there, what's the excuse for it? There's no excuse, is there? You should learn and grow and study. We should put in the effort, and it's our responsibility. It's our obligation. So uh, Hebrews 5, the end of chapter 5, and Hebrews 6 applies even to us today. Yes, he was speaking to them specifically, but it deals with us too, right? The principles are, are valid and applicable to us. We've got to grow. We've got to grow and move beyond just the elementary things. Why are you a member? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Ask the preacher. You know, we've got to be able to explain this. We should be able to. And folks, what do you think the Lord sees when he looks down and you have a perfect golden opportunity to teach someone the truth that you don't even know because you haven't put in the effort to study? Please don't let that be said of you. Please. Now, you know anybody's got my number, call me 
and I'll come running. I got no problem with it. But we know that it's it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just ours. It's not just mine. It's everyone's. Chapter seven. Chapter seven. Now we're getting into some really emphatic contrast. Chapter seven. A superior priesthood. A superior priesthood. He goes in in almost thirty verses, and he goes into great detail of the priesthood, how the priesthood was like that of Melchizedek, that is not according to the law of Moses, that is not according to lineage, but a different priesthood, it would be what Melchizedek would symbolize, and that was an eternal priest, and there was only one man that could do it, verses 23, 24, and 25, and that was Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at some of those verses at the end of chapter 7 in the lesson tonight on a specific point in a specific verse. So chapter 7, superior priesthood, chapter 8. Superior covenant. A new and superior covenant. Chapter 8, in the first several verses, he goes into detail and he tells you why that, that uh, there was a change in the covenant. And it was because that Jesus Christ could not be priest under that covenant. So he had to change the priesthood. Uh, therefore, of course, Hebrews 7, 11 through 14, he had to change, uh, he had to change the covenant because the priesthood was changing. And this is going to be a new covenant, isn't it? It's going to be distinct, isn't it? Uh, I was reading the other day a book, uh, Jim McGuigan, who is, he is liberal now, but he used to be pretty good on it, and he's still got a lot of really good material. But he had debated, uh, uh, he had debated Max King on 8070 stuff years and years ago, and I, I, I got his book, and I was reading that, uh, the, some of the points he made on the debate, and some of the points that Max was trying to make, and he had said that Max believed that it wasn't that the Old and the New Covenant ran concurrently, but that they were the same covenant. That the new covenant was the old covenant resurrected. Folks, that's baloney. Is all you can say about that. That's complete ludicrousy. The new covenant is absolutely and 100% distinct from the old. And I'll just give you a few examples to show you what I'm talking about. The old law went forth from Exodus 20, Sinai. The new law went forth from Isaiah 2 from Jerusalem. The old law went forth all those years ago, 2,500 years uh, way back then. Uh, uh, 2,000 years or 2,500 years past creation. The, the new law went, uh, went into effect 1,500 years later. You've got a different time. You've got a different place. You've got a different law. Compare Exodus chapter 20 to the New Testament. Some principles are the same, but it's absolutely distinct. You can even see that distinction being made more emphatically by Christ in Matthew 5 as he iterates some of those things of the old law that they completely miss and how they still apply because they're moral, constant, unchanging principles. And you've got a new mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5, Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. And folks, uh, there is a tremendous contrast. If you read the book of Hebrews objectively and you come to the conclusion that this the, it's the same covenant, then you've lost your mind. There's no possible way you can come to that conclusion reading this book and just this book objectively. Now, you need some help. Sometimes folks need a little help getting into false doctrine. And, and, and these guys will help you. right? They'll give you. They'll scratch those ears for you. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, but you can't read this book and come to that conclusion objectively and honestly. And that's what's so bad about this. Some of this stuff is just absurd. Chapter 9. Chapter 9 deals specifically uh, with the tabernacle itself and the service. And both are shown to be superior under the new as contrasted to the old. So again, remember, the book of Hebrews is a book of contrast. So he begins with describing the tabernacle. He, he not only describes the tabernacle, but he describes the service of the priest in the tabernacle. Now when these things were thus ordained, verse 5, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Verse 6, but in the second, the high priest will all once every year. Not without blood, but he offered for himself with the ears of the people. I think verse, verse 7 is of tremendous significance, and so many people don't even appreciate the significance of this verse. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way to the holiest of all is not yet made manifest. While the, while the old tabernacle was standing, while the old law was in effect, there was still separation between God and man. This covenant was not designed to redeem. It was designed to teach. And the new covenant was designed to be a law of pardon. So he goes into detail and he shows you all these things. He says that these things were carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Then he makes it another contrast, but Christ, but, how many times is that word used in this book? But Christ, as a, uh, excuse me, but Christ, 
He would be a bringer intermediator of something new. He would be a high priest of a new covenant. Not with the, the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. Not with these daily offerings of the priest, but by one offering. And he would go back and even show you that blood has always been pertinent to this concept. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of, of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled with the book, and all the people sang, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. God bound them with blood then, and God bounds with blood now. The blood of animals then, and the blood of Christ now. And we talked about that some earlier in Bible study this morning. So chapter 9, uh, great detail on the superiority. And then we get into some difficult texts as you get further down into the, the, uh, the chapter. Uh, specifically, we looked at verses 26 through 28. Those, are, uh, those have a lot of information in them as well. Chapter 10. Chapter 10, we are now dealing with a superior offering. We had said that the word offering is used several times in the book of Hebrews. Six or seven times in the book of Hebrews, and every one of them is in this chapter. Offering, a superior offering, is the emphatic declaration of this chapter. And of course, Jesus is that superior offering. He is the perfect offering, uh, and as contrasted even to those offerings of chapter 9. Remember how much time we spent in the book of Leviticus in chapter 9? Going through chapter 16, the Day of Atonement, over and over and over. Well, we're going to keep looking at that because it's all still related to the text at hand. But we've got now a, a superior offering in Jesus Christ. And we're going to go over some of those verses uh, tonight as we look at this uh, in chapter 10. Uh, speaking of this superiority. The law was a shadow of things to come. Verse 1. But not the very image of the things. Now, let's, let's just go back. Just to humor me for a minute. Remember what this guy said? They said that the old was the new. For the law was a shadow of good things to come, but not the very what now? Image. Can his doctrine stand in light of what verse? No. Foolishness. It's foolishness, isn't it? Can something be the image and also the shadow? Silliness, isn't it? You see how easy it is to refute error that these folks, they, they get themselves dug in some false doctrine, don't they? And rather than being honest, they just keep on digging. And that's, that's sad. So the law was a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of the things. It was, it was a foreshadow of something far greater to come. And specifically, as it relates to, as we get further down into the chapter, specifically relating to now the offering. Go down a few verses. Speaking of the offering of the, the blood of bulls and goats who could not take away sin, that there was a remembrance again made of sin every year. These were intended to remind them not to, not to forgive. It wasn't this blood that forgives, but it was to remind them that blood needed to be shed every year, over and over and over. Then verse 5, where he speaks of Christ. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written to me to... Uh, uh, then he goes and says, Above when he says, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not neither have pleasure therein. Why? Because they're offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we're sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ. Once for all. Now, that's verse 10. So connected directly to the previous verses, Regarding God not desiring the sacrifices under the law, but one sacrifice forever. So that's the verses we just quoted, verses 5 through 9. Remember, we're contrasting the old. Go all the way back again, even to, uh, even to verse 1, it being a shadow. Even to verses 2, 3, and 4, where it speaks of the blood of these bulls and goats being a remembrance but that which would not take away sin. And then verse 5 ties in. But Christ was prepared. A body was given to him so that he could be that sacrifice. And then we get on into uh, Jesus Christ coming to do the will of God, which was to die for us, for a suitable offering. By the which will we are sanctified. Now, it's probably been a, at least a couple of weeks since we've gone into any detail on the concept of sanctification. But sanctification is to be set apart, right? You're set apart for a specific use. Think back in the, uh, in the book of Exodus 
right around verse uh, chapter 33 or so, when he was given the commandments for them regarding the anointing oil or the specific uh, uh, incense that was to be burned. That was to be followed as a very specific recipe of uh, explicit details as it, re as it relates to the amount of each individual ingredient. And that, it, that, that uh, oil or that incense could only be used for one purpose. And if man used it for any other purpose, that man's going to die. That is the concept of sanctification. It was set apart for this purpose and this purpose only. And really when you get down to it, there's only one purpose for man. Now it isn't to make as much money as you can before you die. It isn't to live the most glamorous lifestyle. It's to, it's to glorify God. We are set apart for one purpose. Now that doesn't mean, because obviously, if we're going to glorify God properly, we've got to have make a living so we can support our family and support the work of the church. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying the primary purpose of our life is to glorify God. Isaiah 43, 7 and 8. That's our purpose. So we are actually just as uh, uh, these other things. We are also sanctified. In Exodus 29, verse 33, it says, And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and sanctify them. Notice that the stranger could not eat them, could it? The priest could, but the stranger could not. Notice how consecrate and sanctify are used in a synonymous sense in this text. John 17 and 19. Notice what the Bible says about man being sanctified. And for their sakes, Jesus said to the Father, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Wait a minute. Hebrews 10, 10 says, by the which will we're sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ. John 17, 19 says we're sanctified through the truth. Is that a contradiction? Of course it's not. John 17 and verse 19 gives you the how. John, uh, Hebrews 10 verse 10 gives you the what. These are, are not contradictory. They're supplemental. Truth sanctifies man, but it does so when man responds to it. Uh, that's when the offering of the body of Christ can actually, uh, uh, that's when it can benefit man. Because man responds in obedience to the gospel. Acts 20 verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. What's able to do that now? The Word of God. The Word of God is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them who are sanctified. Who's that? The church. Christians. Those are the only individuals who are sanctified according to the Bible. Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes, Paul is being spoken to by the Lord, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Same concept. Set apart. They're set apart. How are they set apart? They, they learn the truth. They obey the truth. They're forgiven of sin. And they change their lives. They're no longer engaging in those things. And they are sanctified. They are made holy by the Lord's gospel, by His mercy, and of course also by their faithful compliance. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, and with, and with uh, all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, both theirs and ours. Who's, who are the sanctified now? Who, who? The church. The church of Christ. How do we know that's the church of Christ? Paul taught the same thing in every church. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. You know what he says it again three chapters later. Chapter 7, verse 17. He taught the same thing in every church. What did he teach? He taught the gospel of Jesus. What did that make? Made the church of Jesus. That's pretty easy. It's hard to miss that. Remember we said some folks need help missing it? They'll miss it, but, but you need a little help to do it. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you're justified in the name of our Lord and by the Spirit of our God. Is 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11 a contradiction of John 17 19? Is saying we're sanctified by the authority of Christ and by the Spirit of God? Is that contradictory to John 17 19 that we're sanctified by truth? No, it is not. The truth is how the Spirit sanctifies. Through truth. The Spirit, uh, the Word of God, the truth is a product of the Spirit. John 6 and verse 63. Remember when Jesus was speaking to the churches in Revelation in chapter 2 and verses 7, 11 and 17. When he was speaking to them, he said, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What was he saying? He was speaking the inspired Word. And when they heard the inspired Word, they are the words of what now? The Spirit. Same concept. 
Ephesians 5, 26. Then he might sanctify and cleanse it. The antecedent of it is the church with the washing of water by the word. Is that contradictory to John 17, 19 or to 1 Corinthians 6, 11? Or, or Acts 20, verse 32, or Acts 28, 16, or 26, 18? Is that contradict those? Of course it doesn't. How many folks have done word studies on the word sanctify and just see how many different things it says, it lists, that sanctifies, and understand that all of these are synonymous or harmonious rather than contradictory? If we really understand the word of God, then it is truth, it can't contradict itself. Therefore, we must understand it in such a way as it's harmonious. And all of this is harmonious. That, it, that shows you how. By the word. You remember where it said 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, by the spirit? And it said uh, John 17, 19, by truth. That's the same thing as by the word. And the word is what leads us to be what? Washed. And that's when we're what? Sanctified. It's easy. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And listen to this. And belief of the truth. Those are synonymous concepts. When you believe the truth and you respond to it, you're sanctified by the Spirit. Same concept. Finally, Hebrews 13, 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Is, is the concept of being sanctified by blood uh, contrary or contradictory to being uh, 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 sanctified by truth? John 17, 19. Or sanctified by the authority of Jesus? 1 Corinthians 6, 11. No, they're all harmonious. They? they all work together. As we've noticed, sanctification involves being set apart or consecrated. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says this, beginning in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are, not, uh, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So he says again, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. How, how often do we emphasize something as it relates to Christian living? And how important it is to actually do so properly. <clears throat> you can't be a Christian if you're not living right. Period. Christian isn't just a designation. It's a description. We've got to be careful of, of that use. The man that is purged himself and this man that is honorable, this man is sanctified and he's ready to go to work. All right. So we understand sanctification. How are we sanctified? Through the offering of the soul of Jesus. Is that what that says? Through the offering of the, the poor, little, damned, depraved, sinful soul of Jesus. Is that what that said? You know folks are teaching that Jesus died spiritually. Again, this is just baffling to me. And there are some folks in the church that don't realize that that's what they're implying when they say that Jesus literally took their sins. But that's exactly what it implies. And that's why I don't teach that. That's why I actually take opportunity to show that that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't literally take your sins. No, he did not. He did he, did, he allowed himself to be offered. He was the sacrifice. You could even go as far as to say that he bore the punishment. I don't mind saying that. But he certainly didn't actually literally take your sins. I can't be guilty because you're guilty. Jesus wasn't guilty because we are. He did bear punishment. He was an offering. And there is a difference. Anybody think that, that those animals back there that, that, that were slaughtered, that they were actually guilty of the sins of the children of Israel? Through the offering of the what now? Body. What kind of death did Jesus die? Physical death. Did Jesus die spiritually? Uh-uh. No, he didn't. What kind of death? Look, notice, Matthew 27. He went to Pilate. Joseph, Pharaoh, but then he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. He begged for his what now? His body. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Colossians 1, 22 and 23. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy without blemish and unreprovable before him, if so be that you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the gospel which you've heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven, whereof all Paul was made a minister. Yet now he hath reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. How did he do it? How did he reconcile in the body of his what now? Flesh 
through what? Death. That's, that's easy, folks. Isn't that? What kind of death did he die? Well, it involved the body, it involved flesh. He died physically. 1 Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live in the righteousness by whose stripes you are sealed. Oh, wait a minute, Eric. You just said he didn't bear our sins. That's right. I did say that he didn't literally bear our sins. That word bear, same word in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And that word in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 is offer up. He offered up himself as a sacrifice. That's what this verse teaches. It doesn't teach that he literally took his, our sins in his body. How does one even do that, by the way? 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. How did he suffer? In the flesh. What kind of death? Physical death. Through the offering of the body of Christ. Hebrews 10, 10, the verse we're looking at right now, is, is the most irrefutable, straightforward verse there is that I've seen. Uh, he was offered through the, the offering of the body of Christ. What was offered for us? The body of Christ. Not the, not the, the, the poor, depraved, sinful soul of Christ, because it wasn't depraved and it wasn't sinful. And Jesus died in a separated state from God, guess where Jesus would have gone? The same place every other man that dies in a, in a lost state would go. And he didn't, did he? Luke 23, 43, today thou shalt be with me where? Paradise. That's not the same place as Tartarus, 2 Peter 2. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world he hath feared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus died physically for us, not spiritually. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Remember the book of Hebrews dramatically uh, puts emphasis on the tremendous difference between the old and the new. And that's exactly what this is. The priest of old would stand daily. Notice Numbers 28. Verse 3 says, And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord. Two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day. So in chapter 9, he spoke of the high priest duties, didn't he? In the veil. And right now, he's talking about the daily duties. Not even the high priest, just the priest. And they would stand and they would offer all the time, over and over, day by day. Hebrews 9, 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That is contrasted to, we're going to see in just a moment. Actually, we're probably not going to see in just a moment because we don't get into that from verse 12. But we're going to see the contrast of that, and that is blood Jesus. After this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, he sat down. And that's a big difference. Ministering and offering. Hebrews 8, beginning verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins, wherefore it, uh, wherefore it was of necessity that this man, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be priest, seeing that they uh, offer these gifts according to the law. And that, of course, served under the example and shadow of heavenly things, and Moses is used as an example as he was going to prepare the tabernacle. God said unto him, See that thou makest all things according to the pattern. Show to thee in the mount. It was a foreshadow. Hebrews 7, beginning of verse 27. Who needeth not daily, speaking of Christ, who needeth not daily to offer sacrifice for sins, first for his own sins, and then for the heirs of the people. For this he did once by the offering of himself. Now that's a difference, isn't it? That's, that is a tremendous difference. Uh, and it's, it's emphasized. I can't, I personally can't emphasize it any more than the, the inspired writer did because he goes over it over and over and over and he makes such tremendous statements about it. <clears throat> so these folks were the same sacrifices for sins. Remember this text, Leviticus 16? How many times have we read this in the last month? Chapter 16, verse 33 and 34. This is the day of atonement. How often? Year by year. Every year. Once in a year, the Day of Atonement, the same sacrifices, and these sacrifices are not what removes sin. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, remember we talked about that earlier? The law was a shadow, but these could never make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience, but they stood only, uh, they stood, uh, only as a remembrance. And of course, 
It was not the blood of bulls and goats that should take away sin. That didn't take it away, but something did. Wherefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but the body has thou prepared me. Verse 5. Christ's sacrifice would take away sin. So we're preparing for verse 12. Study up on verse 12. There's going to be a lot in that. It may even be one verse. As I've gone through, I've got a lot of notes on it so far uh, for next week's lesson. And it may be the only verse we cover, but we may get into two. But there's a lot in it. So make sure that you uh, read a little bit forward in this good study. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel? If you have never obeyed the gospel in your accountable age, you must hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You must believe it, John 20, 30, and 31. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. You must confess Christ before men, Romans 10, 10. And you must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 22, 16. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And you must be faithful to God every day of your life, walking in the light of his teachings. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful? Uh, are, are you going to allow something to come between you and your God? And are you going to uh, suffer for all of eternity for that? I certainly hope not. Uh, you should examine yourself as we all should daily. And if you have any need, we would invite you to consider your condition as we sing this song. And if you have any need, we would offer prayers on your behalf. But acknowledge those things that are sinful in your life. Repent of those. Change your mind about them. Set your mind to do right. And God will forgive you. And if you need our prayers, we'll offer them on your behalf. Uh, this invitation, as we sing it, please come forward. If you have any need, we'd be glad to help you in any way we can. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing. The voice of the Savior says, Come, the